days in the um, in the light of everything that's been going on down here in Skid Row. Yeah. We've had a lot of deaths that have been going on, and we've had a lot of problems and issues with changes that are going on even in the church. And what happens is that we have people that are angry out there, we have people that get angry even in the church. And anger is something that we need to really, really get a, a, a real handle on. Boy, that makes me angry. No, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anger. I want to speak to you today from the name of this sermon. It's called Be Angry, Just Don't Sin. And you know, it's funny, and I want to, as we, before we go any further, I want to say that this is what this life is really all about. A lot of us, we have the tendency to think to ourselves, you know, I need, to tell, I need God to tell me what He wants me to do. Do you know something? I want you to understand something. Everything that's in this world was made here for you. Amen. And so you don't have to worry about anything because when I asked God, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know what he said to me? He spoke it to me in my spirit. He said, Tony, do whatever you want. Just don't sin. And that's what it's all about. You can do whatever you want, just don't sin. We're going to be taking this message from the book of Matthew, chapter 5. But I want to talk about anger a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, because, you know, my job many times here in the church is to make decisions. And, I mean, not only to teach and to preach, but to make decisions. And I am not so, you know, full of myself to think that every time I make a decision, everybody's going to be happy with it. That's not the way it works. Amen? But the thing is, is that we need to be in control of our, our issues and our anger so as not to set yourself up against the very church that you serve, the very God that you serve up. Amen? We don't want to let our anger take control of us. We need to always be in control of our anger. So, anger. You know, it's been the downfall of many people through the ages, has it? I mean, not only has it caused much loss of life, but it's also caused untold transgression of the law of God and man. We're going to look at some of those transgressions today and see how we can avoid such foolish behavior. Behavior that can send us down a wrong path into a ruined relationship with God and with others. Turn your Bibles right now, Matthew 5. We're going to read 21 through 26. And let's see how God views such behavior. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. The Word of God says, says, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there, remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last we can see here that God looks at this problem of anger very seriously, doesn't he? But we need to ask the question here. Is anger wrong? Is it a sin? Is there ever a time when anger is justified? And what are some of those examples of justifiable anger? Or righteous indignation? First of all, handling anger is a very important topic. Statistics report that 50% of the people that are seeking counseling are dealing with anger issues. 
Anger is responsible for tearing apart relationships, shattering communication, and completely ruins the joy and the health of many people that are going through it. Now, it's important to understand that anger is an energy that is God-given. Understand that. It is a built-in tool or mechanism that is intended to help us solve certain kinds of problems. But when it is improperly used, it can cause us to seek selfish goals. It can linger in our hearts and begin to poison our very demeanor, turning us into negative, untrusting, rotten. Let me say that again. Rock. I like that. And destructive individuals. Desiring nothing but revenge. If it's not kept in check. We've experienced that even right here in the church, haven't we? People get angry. People get mad. And what do they want to do? They want to, they want to exact revenge. What is that all about? You want revenge on your brother and sister even in the church? Has it anything? Haven't they remembered anything that was taught to them? It doesn't seem like it, does it? Now, what does the Bible say about anger that is not used properly? Well, James 1.20 says that the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. What does that mean? Well, what it's talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is that anger oftentimes blurs the boundaries. It blurs... It blurs the boundaries of discipline. How does that happen? Well, those of us who have children, we know what that's about, don't we? We get ourselves, you know, our children do something wrong, you know, and we know that it's wrong. And what happens? We get so angry with them. And then what happens? We want to discipline them, but we have to be very careful, don't we? We discipline our kids in, in, in the wrong way. The next thing you know, the police are there trying to discipline you. I remember my father, he used to beat me all the time, and he used to beat me. Now, I thought that the punishment was supposed to match the, the, the wrong and the crime. <laughs> what was happening with that? I used to get beat up, and my father, he would come across the room, too. I'd come up against the wall, and he'd beat me up, you know, till I got 17, and I just got my brown belt in Chinese tempo. Pops got up, came across the room, and I said, and I looked at him, <laughs> I was ready. I said, come on, Dad, come on, you want to hit me? Come on, if it makes you feel good. He goes, now I ain't going to hit you. He goes, pack your stuff and get out. <laughs> I said, okay. I had my motorcycle and my job and my, I had a Chevelle Super Sport. I packed my stuff and got out. Went to start taking care of myself. But anyway, you got to watch out for that discipline. I mean, the anger, it blurs the boundaries. It blurs the lines of where it is and how we're supposed to discipline our loved ones. Um, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Let me, uh, let me read that to you. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Okay? So I want you to understand, anger, if it's not God, if you don't, if you don't keep it in check, you're really, really setting yourself up for a whole lot of problems. What does that mean? If you've got unchecked anger, if you're not taking care of the anger issues in your life, sin is crouched at the door waiting for you. Its desire is for you. Trying to get you to do and to act out. And instead of stopping and thinking about what it is that you need to do. Amen? It says, be angry, yet do not sin. It says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Well, what, you know, what's that talking about? It's definitely important between spouses, isn't it? A man and a wife that said, you know, and, and let me tell you something. You're going to have little spats here and there. You know, my wife and I, we have little spats. And I go, look, girl, you want to mess with me? I won't give you no allowance. She says, I work my own job. I'll keep my check. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can't be angry. You gotta always never let the sun go down in. What are you gonna get in bed and turn your backs to one another? What's that all about? Don't let that happen to your relationship. And I'll tell you something, keep a good sense of humor. You have to always have a sense of humor, especially with your, your wife or your husband. I remember when I first got married to my wife, we went to a, a barbecue. Barbecued up a bunch of chicken. A bunch of barbecue chicken, fried chicken was all in this pan. 
We're going to take some home so we can have some dinner, right? So I took it and she had to, took that uh, tray of chicken and I put it on the back trunk of the car. And it slid off the trunk of the car and onto the ground. Chicken was everywhere. I got mad too and I said, what are you doing? What? I said, what are you doing? And she looked at me and she said something and I said, you know what? I'll take this chicken and I'll throw it all over the ground. And she goes, well, isn't that what you just did? <laughs> I had to laugh. It just caught my funny bone. It's like, well, she had a point there, you know. And, uh, and and it's funny, all the anger just went away. Got to keep a sense of humor. Always. It's also not good between your significant other. If you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you get angry with one another, what happens? It can destroy your relationship. You know, you can sit there and look at each other and, and the first thing she's thinking is, I don't want nothing to do with him. And you're thinking, I don't want nothing to do with her. And the next thing you know, you ain't got nothing to do with each other. And there goes your relationship. It's all over with. You've got to be careful of that. On top of that, it's not good for your daily activities or your work. You know, anger festers inside you. It will affect your health. It will affect your health if all you can do is just be angry all the time. They say that anger will make you shrink. And I've watched people that were so filled with hatred and anger that they literally began to shrink. They weren't as tall as they used to be and their bodies just began to shrivel. Hatred will do that because you know something? It's a, lot of, it's a lot of pain in hatred and anger. It's not good. You've got to let that thing go. Romans 3, 13 and 14 says, Their throat is an open grave and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of acts. Is under their lips. What is this talking about? It's talking about that when we get so angry, what happens? We begin to gossip about that individual. We begin to gossip, you know, gossip and stuff. <laughs> we begin to gossip about it. They, they get so angry and so upset about something. Next thing you know, we got something to say. I, I, I don't like her. And, and look at that dress. Look at the way she wears it. Huh. We're going around just like that, just talking about this. And then what happens? We get angry with one another and begin to talk behind the other one's back. What do they call that? Backbiting. Backbiting. That's just something. And what does that do? It doesn't feed nobody. And it's just, just hatred. And all it does is just mess with your internal. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you're backbiting, most of the time, that other person don't even know what you're saying. They go on about their happy-go-lucky life. You backbiting and carrying on it. And what is it? It's affecting you. It isn't affecting them. Amen? Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. We see that every day out here, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care how many times have we been sitting right here. That's amazing, isn't it? I can swear that I'm seeing Satan drive that truck. <laughs> anyway, we're sitting there, and um, they lose their temper out there. You can hear them when they when they start either across the street over here, maybe across the street over here. And man, they're cussing somebody out and carrying on, and, and sometimes I have to close the door because the words are so foul, saying stuff that I have never ever heard before. So we gotta, <laughs> we gotta watch out for that, don't we? You know, we gotta be careful. We see it out here every day. And you know something, the real sad part about it is sometimes we even see it in the church. We got people that get so angry and they're mad. They're mad at me or whatever the case may be. And they'll even walk through the church, cussing people out, telling everybody in here they're going to hell. And I'm like, what is that about? You know, what kind of stuff is that? You're so angry that you want to talk about every, just, just to come in and just be disruptive. And, and all that kind of stuff, all out of anger. To the point that what have you done? You have damaged yourself. Don't you know that if you're going to come in here and say something like that to the family of God, to the body of Christ, that you're setting yourself up for major issues with Jesus Christ himself? Do you think that he's going to just look at you and say, oh, that's my child, aren't they cute? No, he's not going to think it's cute. 
We need to be careful of the way that we behave, and especially with God's children. Amen? Amen. So what does the Bible say about anger that is proper? Does God get angry? Of course he does. In fact, Psalm 7, 11 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. Now, what kind of indignation? It's righteous indignation. He is incensed by some of the things that we do and the things that we say and our behavior each and every day. Some of us know exactly what's going on with that, too. We know that the things that we sometimes do is not pleasing to God. And sometimes we even do it with the intention of thinking, well, God will forgive me. Yeah, he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. You confess your sin. He'll forgive you. But don't think that he just lets it go by and lets you get, lets you get away with it. It's not that way. There's always a price to pay for, for sin that we commit on purpose. We know that it's wrong, but we do it. How does it affect us? It doesn't affect us whether or not we get into heaven or not. No, because Jesus took care of that, didn't he? But what it affects is our rewards. And I don't know about you. We get, I want my rewards to be great. When I'm trying to get around heaven and stuff, I don't want to have to get on a skateboard. You know, you know, we got golden streets. Got streets made of gold, man. I need a car that needs to match that street. So I want to get around with, I want to get around some way. Let me give me a oh, skateboard. I want, to, I want my life to be good. Amen. Don't you? Don't you want everything that God wants for you? Amen. Amen. So let me give you an example of Jesus when he was experiencing righteous indignation. Let me set the stage for you. Jesus has entered the synagogue and there was a man there whose hand was withered. Now, the Pharisees were watching Jesus to see if he was going to heal this man on the Sabbath. So Jesus calls the man forward and he asks him, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? Now, Mark 3, 5 states that when Jesus was sitting there, after looking around at them with anger or righteous indignation, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now, Jesus was upset. Why was he upset? First of all, we don't understand. These people did not understand what the Sabbath was really all about. The Sabbath was not placed here, or the Sabbath was placed here for man. Man was not put here for the Sabbath. Amen. Sabbath was placed here so the man could get rest. And on top of that, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. So if anybody is going to be able to do something on the Sabbath, it would be him. But these Pharisees were looking at him because they did not believe in who Jesus was in the first place. They would not accept the fact that Jesus could do what he was going to do and that he was righteous in the way that he did it. So what he did was he was upset with these people because they did not care about their own brethren that had an opportunity to be healed 100%. How would you feel it? How would you feel about it if you needed to get healed with something that's bothering you? You had an opportunity to have it done right here during church service or on the Sabbath, which is on a Saturday. And because it's on one of those days, somebody looked at you and said, no, and you wouldn't even let you get healed because of that. What would that make you feel like? That's terrible, isn't it? Isn't it good that you have a God that doesn't care about that? That he can heal you and, and even bring about miracles on, at any time that he wishes? That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Also, I'm going to read you Galatians 2, 11 through 14. And the reason why I'm going to read this to you is that we're going to talk about another type of righteous indignation. This is when um, Paul rebukes Peter in front of all for his, for his uh, uh, hypocrisy. 12, 11 through 14, he says, But when Cephas, who is Peter, came to Antioch, I, talking about Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by that hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, 
in the presence of all. If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now when we think about how that was said, sometimes Paul puts things in certain words that's a little difficult to understand. So let me explain this to you. Peter, as they brought the gospel and was opening up this new church, they began to teach the gospel and what it was all about, the plan of salvation. And what was the plan of salvation about? It's about, and it still is to this day, everybody is the same. There is nobody more than anybody else. All the races. In fact, in Jesus Christ now, we are all one man. When we receive Christ Jesus, when we receive that, that Holy Spirit and become born again, we're all the same. And so that's what the message of the gospel is. So Peter, at first, when he was there by himself, he used to sit and eat with the Gentiles, having a great old time, talking stories and this and that. Everybody is one. All of a sudden, here comes James. He brings in the Jews. So the Jews came in, and they sat over here, and Peter gets up and he goes. And he walks away from the Gentiles. He wants to go over and hang out with the Jews. So what happened? Peter's doing that. He was separating himself. And the message of the gospel was being tainted, wasn't it? Because he was not treating the Gentiles the way that they should have as one. And Paul, one thing I love about Paul, Paul never messed around. He put him on blast. He said, hold up, hold up, hold up, Peter, hold up. What is going on, dog? <laughs> well, he didn't say dog, but, you know, he said, what's, <laughs> what's going on? He said, what are you doing, man? You mess around here, you leave over here, and the Gentiles go over here and sit with the Jews. Even Barnabas is following you. It's a bad example. Amen. What is it that you're doing? So he put him on blast and he told him, he asked him a question, he says, how can you, you know, you've been living with the Gentiles, you've been eating with the Gentiles, everything has been cool, now all of a sudden the Jews come in, you want to separate from them. How can you, living like and eating and living like one of the Gentiles, how can you now expect the Gentiles to become like a Jew? If you're going to do that, okay, Lord. If you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you get this straight. Amen? Make sure that you don't get yourself dipped in hypocrisy. We need to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. We need to make sure that we don't let ourselves get dumped in hypocrisy. What does that mean? Don't sit there and preach one thing and do another. Amen? Walk the talk. Make sure that you do the right thing. And when you walk the talk, don't do it just so that people can see. You need to walk the talk even at home behind closed doors. Amen? Even behind closed doors. Now 2 Samuel 12 chapter, it starts talking about something else. It starts talking about the sin that David had done. Nathan comes to David with a story of a traveling stranger. Now how does this all start? Let me, let me set, this, set this up for you. First of all, David is walking around on the roof of the palace. Now this was during a time when all the kings are supposed to be out with their armies fighting battles. But David decided to hang back. Now he ain't got nothing to do. He's just kind of kicking back and he's enjoying things and it's in the heat of the night. So he gets up out of bed and he starts walking around on the roof. He walks over to the edge of the roof and he looks down and he goes, hmm. There's homegirl, Bathsheba. She's down there taking a shower or a bath. Now, we got a lot of youngsters that are in there. What is it that we should have done? What is it that David should have done? Turn away. Turn away and walk away. Okay? Now I understand that some of us are young and we might mess up. <laughs> But they say if you stand there and look longer than three seconds, you'd have really messed up. Okay, because what's going to happen here? So David, he walked over and he looked down here and, hey, what, what's happening? And the next thing you know, he's starting to ask questions about it. He calls the servants. He goes, who's that girl down there? Oh, that's Bathsheba. She's married to Uriah, the Hittite, who was one of your soldiers. 
Now, instead of David going, oh, well, okay, never mind, good soul. He goes, no, 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 go get her. Bring her up to the point. Now, she, now he's the king. She's got to do what he says. So he, she goes down, he, they go down there, they grab her, they bring her up to him, and he has his way with Bathsheba. But let me tell you something. Don't think that you can get away with that stuff. All you youngsters out there right now, I'm 61, and I don't even think I can get away with it, okay? Be careful. You can't get away with it. Something will always happen when you do something that you ain't got no business doing. And the same thing happened with David. He had relations with her, and what happened? She was pregnant. Uh Uh-oh, we got an issue. So what does David do? He goes, I know. I'm going to come up with a plan. I need for everybody to think that that's her husband's baby. So he brings Uriah back from the war, from the battle, and he says, okay, uh, come on up here. So what's happening, Uriah? What's going on? Uriah's going, what's going on? Huh? Everything is cool. We're out there fighting. Well, yeah, well, I just thought I'd bring you back in here and kind of give you a break. Let me give you some wine. Here, here's a nice cold bottle of orange Cisco. <laughs> so you... So Uriah is drinking Cisco, having a good old time, and, and David's trying to get him tore up. Here, have another one. Here, have another one. So that when he gets drunk, then he'll go down there and he will seek the wonderful pleasures that his wife has for him. Well, he didn't realize Uriah is a good man. He's an upstanding man. And he refuses to go down there and accept the pleasures of his own home and his own bed while his men are out there on the battlefield. So what does he do? He sleeps on the porch. He will not go in there and have fun and pleasure with his wife. So that comes back to David. So David says, oh man, what are we going to do? He goes, well, let's cut this story short. He says, I'm going to send Uriah out there. And he tells Joab, he says, look, when we're out there and it's in the heat of the battle and everybody's fighting, I want everybody to pull back while Uriah is in the front and leave him out there by himself. So he does that. And what happens? Uriah gets killed. Now, do we... David think that he was going to get away with this? And he obviously did. He must have thought, well, I'm the king. I do what I want. But I'm going to turn right now to 2 Samuel 12. And let me read to you exactly what happened. I'm going to read 1 through 15. It says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, who's Nathan? Nathan is the prophet. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said... This is what Nathan said to David. He says, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. He would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer for who, for who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely this man who has done this deserves die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like this. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, having taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companions. 
and you will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. And then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. You know, this passage of Scripture, we need to really, really take hold of this and understand that the sins that we commit, they don't only always just affect us. That our sins many times affect those that are around us. It is so important for our church here, for those who are in leadership here, to walk straight, to walk that straight and narrow. And Joe will tell you, we're very serious about that. If people who are in leadership in this church decide not to walk with God the way that they should, they are taken and sat down until we work on their problem. Not for punishment or not to hurt them, but to help them get straight now. But at the same time, to protect the church. The church is like a, a big flashlight with all those little LED lights in it. And we shine in this neighborhood a very, very bright light in a very dark place. Whenever anybody in our leadership begins to live their life in sin, it's like one of those LED lights goes out. And if it's allowed to stay in there, it begins to affect the other lights that are around you. And the next thing you know, you're not shining the way that you should. That's a problem. So they need to be removed and sat down, and then we need to, to help them to reprove themselves. We need to help them get back involved in prayer life and their Bible. Because most of the time, when somebody falls off of that, that and goes, falls off the deep end, the main problem is because they're not involved in their prayer life, they're not involved in reading their Bibles, they're not learning and going to Bible studies in church the way that they should. So we have to watch out for that. Also, we need to understand, too, that many times the things that we do when God decides to bring judgment on an individual that has not reacted to his, um, uh, to his, uh, when, he, when he is calling you to repent, many times he'll bring something upon you that is in the open. It's right out in the open and people, you know, you can't hide it. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. When I used to smoke crack, when I fell off the wagon, everybody knew Tony's business. <laughs> and I used to hate that. I'm here smoking crack, man. Everybody knew. Man, Tony smoked crack again. How can you tell? <laughs> everything I did, everything I did, you could tell. You can look at me and tell, man. You know, I couldn't talk right. I couldn't do anything right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking crazy, right? You know how it is. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's just the way that it is. We can't hide that stuff, can we? It just tells on us, man. You know, it just tells on us. So we need to understand, you know, that when we, when we begin to fall into that stuff, and I try to tell people that are here. We had for the longest time, Joe and I, we had people that were here in service to the church. They, they'd play up here on Sunday, man, and then go out there and they'd be on the, on the pipe. For the rest of the week. I said, wait a minute, man. You can't do that in here. We're not going to put up with that anymore. Yeah. And they would lie to me. Oh, Pastor, you know, I ain't doing nothing like that. I ain't smoking, man. And I said, look, man, let me tell you something. I said, you want to know one of the reasons why God put me down here to pastor this church? Because you can't walk through that door high and I don't know what's happening with you. If you're smoking crack, I know. Because I know what that did to me. If you're on heroin, I know. You're going to talk to me. Hey, Pastor Tony, what? <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't do crystal meth. Come in here and I don't know what's happening with you. Hey, what's going on, man? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just all high and everything. I know what's going on with you. I can tell. So don't tell me that you're not doing this or that because I know what's going on. You know, so anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that we need to be careful. Sin 
Sin can affect not only you, but it can, it can affect all kinds of people all around you. Amen? All right. So we can see that anger can definitely serve a righteous person when it's handled correctly. Jesus' righteous indignation was rightfully targeted as the Pharisees, at the Pharisees because of their, um, their hardness of heart. And they were not responding to what Jesus was trying to show them. Unfortunately, when people don't respond to what God is trying to show them, a lot of times it results in judgment. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be judged. You know, I try to follow exactly what the Bible says. I want to judge myself accurately so that God doesn't have to judge me. Amen? That's what I want to do. And sometimes that judgment that happens, it may not be immediately, but somewhere down the road, we either experience it by our suffering, the consequences of that non-compliant attitude with God through conviction, which is okay with me. Convict me, Lord. And what is conviction? That's like when mom and daddy pulled out that belt and tore your behind up. He wants to make sure that you understand you ain't supposed to do this. That's what conviction is. It makes you feel bad. It makes you think about your sin. He, he operates in conviction through your conscience. Or he might exercise that judgment merely by letting you suffer the consequences of your sin. Now, also, on a positive note, Paul's righteous indignation directed at Peter, Barnabas, and the rest of the Christian Jews, they served to be constructive and instructive when he called them, for their, I called them out for their hypocrisy, as well as Nathan's rebuke to David. Both of those examples of anger or righteous indignation resulted in repentance when light was shined on their unscrupulous behavior. So that is what we ultimately want to accomplish when our anger begins to flare. That's why it's important for us not to just react when something happens. Okay, we need to remember what James 1.19 says. It says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We need to take the time to think about what would be the best response to the offense. Remembering that the goal is not retaliation, but forgiveness and reconciliation. 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 God understands anger. It has been given to help us, to provide us with a unique kind of energy that enables us to overcome circumstances that have provoked, that are that, uh, that have provoked us to anger. But God wants that anger to be used correctly in the proper setting to accomplish goals or God's goals and not on our own. So as we learn to implement the fruits of the Spirit into our lives, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of these attributes will help us keep anger under the control of the Holy Spirit. And He will help us orchestrate on how we use it. My name is Anthony Stallworth, and I'm the senior pastor at Central City Community Church of the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community. So I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church, P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 90013.